Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Sakuchi, um, and this is the Wound Care Lecture. So please review this lecture prior to coming to the Immersion Weekend. Um, this is going to be uh, accompanying the suturing lecture, uh, which we are going to be doing hands-on suturing at Immersion Weekend. So please make sure to review this lecture. So to start, um, we're going to talk about consent. So consent is performed depending on the office policy where you're working. Uh, some offices do require consent uh, for all procedures, um, and then some only require them based on what procedure is being done. So for an example, uh, emergency-based procedures, like for example, lacerations, uh, you know, I cut my finger and I need sutures emergently, they generally don't require consents. Uh, however, if you are doing a, a mole removal or something like that, that may require a con consent. Um, and also some facilities require you to do a timeout depending on uh, what type of procedure you're doing and the policy of the facility. So before you are gonna engage in any type of a procedure, you always wanna know what the policies are in your facility. You also wanna know what are you credentialed to do in your facility? So you should know this as a student, okay? So are they gonna allow you to do that? Does your insurance co coverage allow you to do that in that facility? Um, you know, does the school allow you to do that in your facility before you go to do that type of procedure? Um, if you're in doubt, you always need to ask first, okay? Because if something goes wrong, you are going to be the one who is ultimately liable. Uh, and then in practice, same thing. When you go to go out into practice, you're gonna be credentialed, okay? And you're gonna be credentialed in each procedure separately. And so you cannot perform a procedure that you are not credentialed in. And you have to show that you are competent to perform that procedure in order to obtain credentialing in that procedure, meaning that you have to show that you've done so many of those procedures and that you've received specific education in those procedures and that you maintain your competence because you have to be recredentialed every so many years. So this is something that you need to keep track of. So this is why when you're in school, you keep those uh, clinical logs, okay? And it's very important for you to document that, document every patient you see, every procedure you do, everything that you do, because again, you're gonna need this for credentialing. And as you practice out in the real world, you're gonna need this for your recredentialing, which happens uh, every few years. And you get credentialed with your office, your hospital system, insurance companies, um, and it's this ongoing process that happens all the time. Um, and so this is something that's very, very important. So some other things that you may need to do, you wanna always make sure that uh, the patient is aware of any risks and benefits of any specific procedure, and you wanna document this. Um, you know, so if there's a sp something specific, like for example, you had a specific discussion about um, a specific procedure with a patient, you want to make sure that you document that. So wound repair. There are a lot of different types of wound closures um, out there. So these are just some examples, but there's other products on the market. So for example, Dermabond is a type of skin glue, okay? Uh, there's Steri strips, also uh, known as like butterfly stitches. Um, you may have heard uh, it called that. Uh, you can staple a wound, uh, suturing, um, and then also sometimes you just don't repair wounds at all. You allow them to close by what's called secondary intention. Um, and so sometimes you allow wounds to close that way as well. Something that's also very important, you don't want to forget um, someone's tetanus, okay? Uh, that's very, very important. Okay, so whenever you're talking about wound repair, um, you always want to assess someone's tetanus status. Um, tetanus is updated every 10 years. You also give it um, if someone is between five and 10 years, if it's a dirty, contaminated wound. If they don't know when their last tetanus shot was, you always give another one. It's not going to hurt them. Contraindications uh, to wound repair. Uh, if it's a human bite, Okay, because the human mouth is very, very, very dirty. Most human bites get infected. Okay, human bites require antibiotics always. Okay, human bites should not be sutured unless it is severe. Okay, most of them are not. Okay, so they do not need 
generally don't need sutures, but they always need antibiotics. Animal bites, um, depending on the type of animal, um, a lot of them also don't need sutures, again, unless it's large or extensive or if it's on the face. But if it's minor, um, a lot of them you should not suture because anytime you suture it, you're introducing a foreign body, which increases your chance of infection. Okay, so if it's small and it's something that's gonna heal on its own, and if it's in say an area where a scar is not really gonna matter, don't suture it, allow it to close on its own because leaving it open is gonna allow the area to drain. Okay, so and it's gonna decrease your chance of, of uh, an infection. Okay, now with animal bites, for example, dog bites, um, only about 5% of those get infected. So most dog bites actually do not need antibiotics unless you are suturing them or they are large, extensive, um, involve muscles, tendons, something like that. Um, but if they're just small dog bites that you just leave alone, generally you do not need antibiotics. Um, cat bites always need antibiotics. Cat bites, uh, about 80 to 85% of cat bites get infected. Some of them are so bad they require hospitaliza hospitalization. Um, even some that you put on oral antibiotics will come back in two or three days, require IV antibiotics and inpatient admission. Um, so cat bites, real bad, dog bites, not so bad. Um, but dog bites can be really bad because it can be very bit vicious and can cause a lot of significant injuries. Um, in that, in that respect. Um, avulsion. So an evol what an avulsion is, is like I cut the tip of my finger off with a knife. Okay. Uh, so it's like when you cut a big chunk of skin off. So there's not really anything to suture because there's nothing there. Okay. So it's like a big, huge chunk of skin is coming off. Uh, and so with that, there's nothing to suture because there's like nothing there. So there are thing, other things that you can do to, to take care of the wound, but you're not really going to suture it, okay? Uh, wounds that are old, okay? That's also something that generally we are not going to suture, okay? That's something that you may refer to a surgeon or plastic surgeon to suture, but that's not something that we as nurse practitioners are going to do, okay? So wounds over 12 to 24 hours old, that's not for us, okay? Um, closure is always dependent on the circumstances and the location, okay? Wounds that are on the face, generally, um, you know, you can kind of extend the time a little bit, but anywhere else, you know, 12 hours is, is usually the maximum, 24 hours for the face, but anything over that is really not suturable, okay? Why? Infection, 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 okay? So for example, oh, my sutures fell out I, that I got placed two days ago or three days ago. Can you put more sutures in? No, you never put more sutures in. You have to send, you send them to a surgeon or plastic surgeon, let them take care of it. Uh, that is not for us to fix, okay? We are not specialists. Anesthesia. So what do we use to numb the wound when we go to fix things? 1% uh, lidocaine is the most common. Uh, that's the most common thing that you're going to see. 1% uh, lidocaine with epinephrine that we use uh, to improve hemostasis. Okay. So if you got something bleeding all over the place, that's what you want to use. Okay. You want to avoid use ears, nose, fingers, toes, penis. Why? Because they're at the end of things. Okay. And you're kind of cutting off the blood supply. So that's why you want to kind of avoid those areas. Okay. You will see, you know, specialists using that and that's fine. We don't use that, okay? Bupivacaine, it comes in a couple different strengths, 0 0.25, 0 0.5. Um, why would you use this? Um, because you can use this for like a digital block. A digital block is something uh, you would inject it at the base of say a finger or a toe and, um, and it will last uh, a lot longer um, and it can cover a whole area. So if you inject it at the base of a finger, you will numb the entire finger, uh, but it will take a little bit longer to work. So if someone has an allergy to say all of all of the canes. Okay, I'm allergic to all of the cane products. You can use diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. Okay, so it's the liquid form of IV Benadryl, diphenhydramine 1%. Uh, you take one ml of the 50 milligram per ml solution with four ml of seral saline, you mix it together and you inject it. Um, and you can use that uh, as anesthesia uh, for people that are uh, allergic to cane products. Uh, so you can use that. Uh, and lidocaine also comes in different strengths as well. You can use 2% as well. 
So what are some concerns uh, when using uh, an, you know, anesthesia? Allergies, you know, like I just said, people are allergic to uh, lidocaine products. Uh, dosing, especially if you have someone with multiple lacerations, uh, significant large lacerations. Um, you don't want to overdose them. So you want to make sure you know the dosages. Uh, plain lidocaine, 4.5 milligrams per kilogram. Lidocaine with epinephrine, 7 milligrams per kilogram. Bupivacaine, 175 milligrams in a single dose. Um, so you want to make sure you know those dosages. Um, you may see them in the future. Also, it really hurts to inject this stuff. Okay, that's usually the most you know, the most painful part of the whole thing, okay? Um, whenever anybody says, oh, is it gonna hurt? And I said, well, it, you know, it hurts for a second. That's what hurts. It's never the needle that hurts. It's always the lidocaine because it burns a lot. Um, so things that you can do, you can kind of buffer it with sodium bicarbonate. I don't really see anybody do that anymore. Um, you can warm it in your hands. So you take the bottle on your hand and you kind of like uh, rub it in between your hands like this. Um, and you can kind of warm it up a little bit. Um, honestly, uh, I don't really know that either of those things help. Uh, I just I just do it really quick. <laughs> that really seems to be the only thing that helps. Um, there's also topical um, preparations that you can use. This um, I find very helpful um, to use, especially on children and also um, like on the face. So I don't really use Emila a whole lot because it's a cream. So uh, Let I use because it's a gel. So let is like uh, lidocaine, epinephrine, and tetracaine. Um, and let I will use on everybody, kids, adults, it doesn't matter. I use it on the face all the time. And I'll use it like on kids, like anywhere on the body, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll put it on there. You don't use gauze, you only use cotton, okay? Why? Because it soaks into the gauze and not on the skin, okay? But when you put it on cotton, it will like not stick to the cotton as much. So that's why you want to use cotton, not gauze, okay? Uh, leave it on for like 30 minutes and then come back and, and do your procedure. It'll be numb. You'll be able to tell because the skin will be all white around whatever, whatever you put it on. That's what you're looking for, okay? Um, generally, if you put that, you won't need to inject anything. I just use let and be done with it. Um, and it's great. So that can be very, very helpful. So, you want to prepare your wound, okay? So you want to control any bleeding. So if something's bleeding, control it. How do you control it? Um, sometimes you have to um, hold pressure, irrigate it, look for the area where it's bleeding. Um, sometimes if you need to um, put like a little tourniquet in the area, depending on where the area is. Um, if it's a really deep wound, sometimes you need to put a suture in there to kind of tie it off. So it kind of depends on the situation. Um, you need to really make sure you're irrigating with normal saline or tap water, okay? Make sure you clean out wounds well to prevent any kind of an infection. If you uh, see any uh, foreign bodies, remove them, okay? Explore the wounds for foreign bodies and also look for any nerve tendon injuries, especially in the hands. Look, 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 okay? Tendons are going to look, uh, they're going to be white and they're going to kind of look like um, thin, uh, they're very white and shiny, almost like a rubber band, like a white rubber band, very shiny. And nerve just looks, a nerve kind of like looks like a white uh, string, very, very, very tiny, super tiny. Um, the tendons are like a little bit bigger, but the nerve is super, super, super tiny. Okay. Um, and, and if you ever, ever, ever suspect a nerve injury or tendon injury in the hand, you refer it, okay? You're gonna put loose sutures in it, uh, put them on antibiotics and refer it. Always, 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 okay? Even if, it, even if you don't know it, if you have any suspicion for it, even if it's a minor suspicion for it, you're gonna refer it. That's why it's super, super important for you to do an exam before you administer any anesthesia, okay? Even if it hurts the person, okay? It's very important, okay? Because you need to know what their sensation and their strength is prior to administering any anesthesia in the hands. Because if you miss a nerve or a tendon injury in the person's hand, you could be potentially liable. Okay, so that is super important. So 
If you have an injury in their hair, you don't want to shave their hair, you could clip it, but usually just push it to the side, suture right through it, staple right through it. Okay. Clean the area with beta dinochlorhexidine, whatever your facility is using. Okay. You want to make sure you're using a sterile technique, drape the wound. Okay. Clean technique has been shown uh, to be appropriate uh, for traumatic repairs. What does that mean? So if you're fixing like a laceration, Okay, so um, I cut myself with a knife on my arm and you're fixing that. You don't need to use a sterile technique. You can use clean technique. You don't need to use sterile gloves. You can use gloves off the wall. That's okay. Um, but if you are doing a mold removal, you need to use very strict sterile technique. Okay, that's the difference. So how many sutures do you need to put in? Uh, about one suture per centimeter. Okay, that is about the estimate, okay? It's an estimate. So you kind of have to gauge as the wound is coming together and looking at it, okay? That's why this is like an art, okay? You're gonna be kind of closer together on the face and other areas of cosmetic concern, okay? If there is a concern for infection, then you have to make your sutures a little bit looser. You don't want it to be super, super, super tight. Okay. Also, it's going to be super hard for you to get this, the sutures out when they're ready to come out if you make them incredibly tight um, or if you like clip them very, very small. Um, it makes them super difficult to get out when it's time to come out. But you also don't want to make them incredibly loose either. So it's kind of like you need to find that good medium. So how do you choose which suture to use? Okay. Uh, there's essentially two major types of sutures, right? Absorbable, non-absorbable, okay? And that's the first thing that somebody's going to ask you, oh, are these the ones that I have to get taken out or are these the ones that are going to dissolve, right? So the answer is, is they're almost always going to be the ones that have to be get, get taken out, okay? Like 99% of the time, the sutures that you're going to be putting in are the ones that have to get taken out, okay? Because really, the only time that you're going to be using absorbable sutures are if you're doing like, sutures inside somebody's mouth, like on mucosal lacerations, but that's like inside the mouth, which you don't do very often, okay? Um, or if you're doing like a two-layer closure and you're still like using non-absorbables for the top layer. So you're really only using the absorbable ones for the inside layer. So, you know, generally the answer is, is yes, you have to get, the, get them taken out. Um, so absorbables are your vicryl and your monocryl your non-absorbable nylon and proline. Um, there are like probably a hundred other ones, but these are kind of the most common. Um, everybody has a different preference on what they like, okay? And what they don't like in regards to type of suture and size and brand and everything else. So everybody has a preference. Like I, ha I definitely have a preference. Um, and so, you may develop that. So, cause I like a specific one. I like the way it feels. I like the way it moves in my hand and all that stuff. And so you may develop that too. So now that we've determined absorbable, non-absorbable, how do you determine which size of suture? So it depends where is it on the body and, you know, is it over an area of high tension? Is it on the extremities? Is it on the scalp? Is it on the face? So if it, you want to use, is if it's on the trunk or area of high tension, like over knee, use a big one, like 3-0 or 4-0. Um, if it's in the extremities or, um, or the scalp or the digits, 4-0 or 5-0. If it's on the face, 5-0 or 6-0. So I personally like 5-0 like probably you're going to probably use like a 4-0 or a 5-0, like 90% of the time, I would tell you. So those are probably the most common, commonly used. So choice of suture technique. This is what you're going to use 99% of the time as a non-absorbable single interrupted suture. Okay. That's what you need to know how to do. If you can do that, that's it. Okay. Unless you're going to go work in surgery, you really don't need to know how to do anything else. Okay. 
That's really all you need to know how to do, okay? It's most commonly used. You can use it for pretty much anything, okay? Um, deep multi-layer closure. You really only need that for extensive wounds, like a two-layer closure, a three-layer closure. You're really only gonna do that in the ER, maybe urgent care, probably not urgent care, but I mean, you, you, prob you probably would do that in the ER every once in a while, okay? Um, you know, you would do that obviously in surgery, but outside of that, you're probably not gonna do that. There are a lot of other techniques um, you can always if, take a suturing course if you want to learn those. We will not be teaching those in this course because we're going to focus on uh, the single interrupted, okay? Uh, that's what we're going to be doing uh, when we're teaching you in person because that's what you really need to do because you can use those uh, when you are, uh, you know, taking off a mole. Uh, you know, you can use those, like I said, for absolutely anything, okay? So. The number one thing that you should do is always start in the middle, okay? Why? If you start at one end, okay, you're going to end up crooked on the other end by the time you get there, okay? So I want you to practice that. Try, try starting at one end. By the time you get to the other end, it's going to look crooked. Trust me. So start in the middle, put one suture in, and then do one side, and then do the other side. Okay, so your exception is, is if you have a wound that comes to a point. So it was like a triangle like this. Um, then what you're gonna do is you don't put your suture in the, in the point, you're gonna go one on one side and then one on another side. And then you kind of do both sides, okay? Um, now a question is, is, well, sometimes I have to take my sutures out, that's okay. So sometimes, especially if you have like a big flap and sometimes it's hard to kind of get it down. Sometimes you have to put sutures in that you know aren't gonna stay in. You put the suture in to kind of hold it down. Then you put more sutures in and then you take that one out. And that suture was just to like hold things down until you kind of move things around. That's okay too. So when do you use glue? So glue is used for superficial skin wounds. They should be minimally contaminated. So no bites or dirty wounds, okay? Why? Because if you put glue over something that is contaminated, then that means it's got nowhere to breathe and it's got nowhere to drain because you've just put a, a, a layer of glue all over the top of it. And so now all of the germs are inside. So it's got nowhere to go. At least if you've got sutures, uh, you've got hole, you know, holes on the side of each suture where things could drain out but now with the glue, it's got nowhere to go. So glue is really good for facial laceration. So you got to cut up here, you can kind of glue it, you know, hold it together, glue it, and it will stay very well. Um, the one thing, you know, everybody says, oh, we're gonna have a scar. So, you know, once it is done healing and the glue comes off, you wanna tell them to use sunscreen on the area daily um, for a year to prevent scarring. Rain, you know, snow, sunshine, doesn't matter what, what the weather is, you need, they need to use sunscreen for a year. So how do you use it? You wanna clean it with just some saline, dry it very well, you know, approximate the edges, okay? And then apply several thin, thin layers and make sure it dries in between. And they should not apply anything to the area after the applications, okay? So no gels, ointments, lotions, nothing. And allow it to come off on its own. So don't let them pick at it, don't let them peel it, nothing like that. So don't apply it on the hands. You're gonna see people apply it on the hands, to wounds on the hands, okay? Trust me, you will see other PAs, MPs, doctors apply it to wounds on the hands. I'm gonna tell you not to do that and I'm gonna tell you why. Because I want you to think about how many times a day you wash your hands or apply hand sanitizer. Now, I just told you, don't apply gels to your hands, right? That dermabond or skin glue, how quickly do you think that that is going to come off your hands? Exactly. So you just glued a wound and that glue is gonna come off in like 24 hours. So I don't know that there's a point in doing that. So that's why I'm telling you, don't glue things on the hands. 
unless that person is going to like wear a glove on their hand for several days. So that, that's what I would tell you. Absolutely not. Do not do it. Don't use it on large wounds or deep wounds. Don't use it. You need to be very, very, very cautious near someone's eye. So if it's very, very close to the eye, unless you are very experienced in using Dermabond, you know, don't, if it's, if it's your very first time using Dermabond, don't use it there. Don't let that be your first time using Dermabond. Um, because you don't want to get it in someone's eye. Uh, if you do get it in someone's eye, bacitracin will dissolve Dermabond. There is bacitracin eye ointment, um, but you need to be very cautious. Normally what I do is if I am applying uh, Dermabond near someone's eye, I will put a piece of gauze like this over the eye, and then I will Dermabond the area. Just that way, the derma bond will get on the gauze before it gets into someone's eye. Staples. So staples are very quick and easy, okay? It's used most frequently for head lacerations, okay? So for example, I hit my head and I have a big laceration to the back of my head um, and it's very quick. You clean the area, you put some betadine on it and then you staple, 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 and you're done. Um, but you can also use it in lots of other areas too, lacerations on someone's leg or arm or anywhere. You can, use, you know, you can really use it for anything. Um, it will cause more scarring. Okay. So that's just one thing to keep in mind if you do staple something. Okay. Um, but it is very quick and easy to use. Again, you want to irrigate it, cleanse it with betadine and about one staple uh, per, uh, per centimeter and use bacitrace into the area after that. Stary strips. So when do you use it? Somebody who's very, very opposed to other closure uh, techniques. Uh, if the wound is over 12 hours old, you can use stary strips, okay? It also has to be low tension wounds because if it's a high tension wound, these are like never gonna work. They're not gonna stay. They're, gonna, they're just gonna come off because like these are not like the strongest, okay? So how do you use these? Same way, You'll, the first step is always gonna be clean, okay? Always number one, clean, dry. So you wanna apply massasol, also called tincture of benzoin, to both sides of the wound, not the wound itself, just the wound. Um, and then you apply one side of the strip and you uh, pull the wound together, like using the strip, and then put the strip on the other side, like where the massasol is. And same thing, you don't apply any ointments, gels, lotions, nothing like that. It will dissolve the massasol and the strip, okay? So no bacitracin, nothing like that. Uh, and then you allow the strips to fall off on their own, avoid getting wet. Um, I usually will send people home with additional strips to go home with so they can kind of like reapply it on their own at home if they fall off. Um, it just kind of allows it to heal a little bit better. So when do you take uh, sutures and staples out? So on the face, three to five days, I usually do five. Scalp, seven to 10. Arms, seven to 10. Trunk, 10 to 14. Legs, 10 to 14. Hands and feet, 10 to 14. Palms or soles, 14 to 21. Air, areas of high tensions, like a joint, 10 to 21. Dermabond and stereo strips, they will flake, it'll flake off or fall off on its own. So how do you take care of avulsions? Again, that's like I said, the tearing off or slicing off of layers of skin, like a knife. Uh, usually it'll have uh, areas of continued bleeding. Uh, treatment is gel foam. It'll stop the bleeding and that you kind of allow to fall off on its own. Sometimes uh, people bleed through the gel foam. Um, so one thing you can do, uh, this is like my newest trick, uh, is so if you have the, they have these uh, like little tourniquets um, that you can put on fingers um, or you can like make a tourniquet to put on a finger. So you can tourniquet the finger. Okay, get it to stop bleeding. Um, that's So that's the one thing, get it to stop bleeding. Don't obviously leave it on there for a long period of time, but just for a short period of time. If you take 1% with epinephrine, put it on some gauze, have them kind of hold it on that area, not for more than like 30 minutes, just topically, and then take it off and then put the gel foam on. 
that seems to be my little trick of the day. I know you're not supposed to put it on digits, but just for a short period of time topically, that seems to be the, the ticket to get it to stop bleeding. For And this is only for people that seem to bleed through everything and are bleeding through the gel foam that you cannot get to stop bleeding. Nail bed injuries. So this is dependent on the injury. Some nail bed injuries are not so bad. Some are disasters, okay? Some, the nail bed is completely gone, okay? Some require replacement of the nail into the matrix of the nail. So if you don't know what the matrix of the nail is, the matrix of the nail is that little part where um, it kind of enters your finger in the back and it's got like the little halo in the back. That's the matrix, okay? So essentially if the entire nail bed is like lifted up, you like have to like literally like push it back in. It's awful. Uh, and then sometimes what you have to do is you actually have to repair the nail bed, which is like underneath. So you have to suture that underneath and then replace the nail. So the most important thing is uh, to protect that underlying tissue. And then if they have a nail bed injury, you have to make sure that there's no bony fracture underneath because then it could be considered an open fracture. A lot of these nail bed injuries will require antibiotics. So these are really complicated injuries. Um, so depending on what kind of setting you're working in, they should be referred to an emergency department. So documentation. So anytime you're doing a procedure, your documentation is very, very, very important because this is how you're gonna be billing for your services. So you need to do a procedure note. So how do you document this? You wanna document every single thing you do, okay? Um, so document anything you do. And then some other things that are very important, the, the length of the laceration. So if you're, docu if you're doing a laceration, the length is like very important. So absolutely document the length. Types of suture you use, the number of suture, uh, sutures you placed, any anesthesia you used. Did you discuss any repair options or offer plastic surgery if it's especially if it's a facial wound? So I place a sample here. You can see that there. Um, again, this is very important. Antibiotics, I kind of talked about this earlier. When do you use them? You don't need them for every single case. Most cases don't require antibiotics. So bites, um, if you have to close it with sutures, they get antibiotics. Otherwise, usually not unless it's a cat bite. Very dirty, it's a super dirty wound, probably needs antibiotics. If there was a foreign body involved, probably needs antibiotics. If it was super deep, probably needs antibiotics. Um, if it was a laceration or suspected laceration of a tendon, nerve, or muscle, antibiotics. Open fracture, antibiotics. So, some patient education, keep clean, dry, and covered. Um, you wanna apply bacitracin, you know, sporin, something like that. No swimming, hot tubs, immersion in water, watch for signs of infection, you know, make sure they don't get it wet for 24 to 48 hours, change the bandage at least once daily, you know, make sure they know when they're supposed to get their staples removed or sutures removed. Uh, incision and drainage. Uh, this is something else that you might be doing fairly frequently. Uh, if it's a fluctuant abscess, meaning that you push on it and it's squishy, it should be drained as primary management, okay? And so what that means is uh, if that is, should be your number one course of treatment prior to antibiotics, okay? So if you cut it open, that is your treatment, okay? May not even need any, any, any antibiotics. You cut it open, you drain it, that's it, Okay. If you push on it and it is not squishy, it's hard as a rock, it may not be ready for drainage. It may need hot packs, it might need, you know, or just antibiotics, like it might need some time, okay? Because you could go to cut it open and nothing happens, all right? Culture the drainage, find out what's in there, okay? Why? Because then you can figure out what the bacteria is, uh, is it antibiotic resistant, which antibiotics uh, work against it, um, all of that kind of stuff. You may need to de-roof an abscess, okay? Because sometimes they'll have a black ashgar on it. You gotta pull that sucker off, okay? Drain it out. 
if it's a perinicia, those are usually pretty easy. Right around the nail bed, you just stick a needle in it and then they drain right out. It's very easy. Um, again, antibiotics, if it's, if it's uncomplicated and small, less than five centimeters, don't need antibiotics. If it's a, a large abscess with cellulitis, if it's extensive, they're immunocompromised, okay, diabetic, something like that, they'll need antibiotics. Um, which antibiotics will you use? It kind of depends on the case. So that's something, you know, definitely you should start looking into, okay, especially as you're going out into practice, which antibiotics would you use for which things? So um, you should look into up-to-date, Tarascon, uh, Pharmacopeia, things like that. So how do you perform an IUD? Clean the area, betadine, um, you know, or whatever you're using at your facility, chlorhexidine. Uh, you may or may not anesthetize a lidocaine. You know, sometimes uh, they're so painful that um, lidocaine really doesn't help. There's just so much pressure, you introduce more pressure, like the lidocaine is like useless. Okay, so really you cut it open, you release the pressure, things are wonderful. Okay, you can use a scalpel, punch biopsy, you incise the most prominent area. Okay. And then some, now the other thing is, especially if you haven't done these before, uh, this is my suggestion. Take a large gauze pad, put it over your scalpel. Okay, because sometimes when you incise, it will squirt across the room. Okay, and I've had students with me and they didn't do that and they have gotten covered all down the front. So just keep that in mind. So yeah, and sometimes it does not smell pretty. So yeah, definitely just keep that in mind. So keep a gauze pad over your scalpel because it will sometimes go everywhere. Sometimes it just kind of drains out nicely, but sometimes it does not. Um, you wanna drain as much as possible. And sometimes you need to explore the cavity. And so that's when at that point you may wanna use lidocaine because that hurts a lot. Okay, if you're gonna break up the pockets. Irrigate it with normal saline. And then, you, then that's when you would wanna maybe consider packing, especially if it's very large. That's kind of controversial, controversial at this point. Um, some have found it to be helpful. Some have found it to not be helpful. The literature is kind of out at this point. If you're going to do that, it should be loose, covered with a dry dressing. Um, the problem with that is then it needs to be repacked every several days. So I have to keep coming back in. Um, and it's very, very, very painful. All right. Well, I can't wait to see everyone at immersion weekend. And, uh, then we're going to be doing, uh, suturing. See everyone soon.